Our next speaker is Michael Kalkowski, my good friend for many minutes. And he has founded two large internet companies. Uh, right now, he is the creative director of Game Duel, and he is going to tell us all about team culture for success. Michael? Thank you very much. So let's start by looking at the state of our industry for a moment. I think this chart here sums it up quite nicely. It's basically a highly concentrated red ocean where, so here you can see the, the percentage of apps um, and the percentage of downloads that are generated by those apps. And as you can see, it's highly concentrated at the top. In fact, the, the best 10% of the apps generate already 90% of all the downloads. The question is why is that so concentrated? What's the reason for that? Is it just luck that these companies are in, in those top 10% or do they have better strategies? Or maybe is it more about uh, how they do it, not so much what they do, but how they do it, their processes and their culture. Who of you thinks that culture is actually more important than strategy, show of hands. Okay, maybe 5%, but you're not alone. Peter Drucker, management guru Peter Drucker said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I've been founding companies uh, since 14 years. It's my favorite topic to look at why do some companies succeed and many companies fail. And I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs about this. And in my view, culture is one of the biggest success factors of all. So today I want to share with you what the, best, the world's best teams do in terms of values and culture and how they run their companies. 10 secrets of world-class team cultures. The first one is about how these teams think about failure. And Stephanie also talked about this uh, before in the session. Um, if you go to the typical company, for them, failure is something bad. If you fail, you're a loser. If you fail many times, then you get fired. If you look at the best teams, they think differently. This is from Facebook, move fast and break things. This is Elon Musk, the CEO of Tesla Motors. He says, failure is an option here. If things are not failing, you're not innovating enough. So the best teams understand that success and failure, they're not opposites, but failure is actually a building block of success. You fail, then you learn, you fail, you learn, you fail, you learn, and eventually you succeed. This is a typical funnel of producing a hit game. So you start out with, maybe you throw out 50 prototypes, and then out of those, 10 are good enough that you put them into production, small team on it, out of those 10, Six go into a larger production and you soft launch them in the test market in Canada maybe. And out of those, three will be fully launched with full marketing support. And then one hit game will, if you're lucky, one hit game will come out of this. So it's a ratio of one to 50. Um, Rovio, they're known for, they, they hit 52 failures before they came out with Angry Birds. So it's a, it's a pretty big ratio of failures that you need. This is from Spotify. And they have a fail wall where they talk about their failures and share it with their team so everybody can learn from their failures. The best teams, they celebrate their failures. The second differentiator between world-class teams is focus. These teams focus on a very few things and do them with absolute excellence. I was two years ago at Casual Connect in, in Hamburg and I saw this guy uh, speak Ilka from Supercell. And back then, Supercell was not very well known. Um, I, didn't, I hadn't heard about Supercell at that point. And you talked about their first uh, tries, the, the games they did, Gunshine and uh, Battle Buddies. And then he said something very interesting. He said, we're going to focus now just on tablet games. I'm making, we're gonna make the best tablet games in the world. And we all know how the, how the story continued. They indeed did build some of the world's best uh, games for tablet, two actually. And this is Steve Jobs. He, he was once asked how, wh what he was most proud of at Apple. And he said, 
I'm just as proud of the things that we didn't do as I am of the things that we did do. And there's this famous meeting when he came back from, from Pixar to Apple and he put all the products that they had at that point at the whiteboard and he looked at everyone and said, okay, can we be really world class at this? And he slashed one after the other and just focused on a very few projects because deciding what not to do is as important as deciding what to do. The third thing is how teams think about and leverage the power of positive psychology. What is positive psychology? I'm not talking about this. This is nice, having fun in the office. That's just certainly helpful. But there's a lot of research, recent research. For example, Sean Ecker from Harvard University. He has uh, written this amazing book, Before Happiness. And there's also a great tech talk, TED talk about it, um, where he talks about the happiness formula and the relationship between success and happiness. And what they found is that this is the traditional way psychologists look at it and people think about success and happiness. So you need to be successful, then you will be happy. You need to make a lot of money, then you will be happy. You have a great love, then you will be happy. It turned out that that's actually the wrong way to look at it. And there's a different, the, the relationship is quite the opposite. Happiness is the input for success. Because if you are happy, if we are happy, our brain is in a different mode. It's in a different vibration. And we are more creative. We see more opportunities. We are smarter. We're more intelligent when we're in a happy brain state. So the best teams understand that and create happiness in their teams. Zappos is known for this. They're not happy because they're successful. They're successful because they're happy. And actually, one of their mottos is delivering happiness. So they do a lot in their team to create happiness. And one of the biggest drivers of happiness is the positivity ratio. If you think of all the interactions between your people in your teams in a typical meeting, what is the ratio of positive versus negative interactions? Positive might be giving a compliment or smiling or saying something positive. Negative might be being aggressive or angry. And it turns out that in order to be happy in a happy brain state, you need at least a ratio of three to one positive to negative. And the best team that recognizes, and you go to their office, you see this in the vibe, how the people communicate and how they work together. Number four is about customer passion. The best teams, they have this as part of their culture. There's a couple of companies that are known for being super passionate about their customers. Amazon is one of them. And Jeff Bezos said, we, we've had three big ideas at Amazon that we've stuck with for 18 years. And they're the reason we're successful. Invent be patient and put the customer first. And Amazon is also known for this great idea of the customer chair. They have an empty chair in every meeting room. And whenever they do a big decision, they look at the chair and, and ask the question, like, what would our customers say to that decision? How would they think about this now? I think this is great. Because a lot of companies, they say customer is number one. We have passion for customer. But then if you look at the reality, it's not really that much the case. Who of you knows Vern Harnish? Vern Harnish, he's the founder of EO, Entrepreneurs Organization, and also management coach. And I happened to be at one of his seminars last year, and he said something very interesting. He said he's coaching all these Fortune 500 companies and, and big CEOs, and he asked them about their values and their priorities. And many of them say, yeah, we're absolutely passionate about customers. That's very important for us. And then when he looks at their daily work and what they actually do, it's not the case. So he has a great tool to coach people and look at that. So he says, don't, don't tell me what your priorities are. Give me your calendar, and I will show you what your priorities are. So he looks at their calendar. And if, if they're not spending 80% of the time talking to customers out in the market, then they're not passionate about customers. Steve Jobs, they actually looked at his calendar. And this is the guy who's known for saying, don't ask the customer what they want. But Steve Jobs was absolutely passionate about customers. And when they looked at his calendar, they found he spent four days a week for three hours a day out talking to customers, showing them the products, interacting with them, getting feedback. He was absolutely passionate about, about the Apple customers. 
Number, number five is about autonomy. How much freedom, how much autonomy do teams give their people? This turns out to be one of the biggest motivators for people, especially for, for creative people. Um, and there's great research about this by Daniel Pink. There's a book, Drive, and he also has a, a very interesting TED talk where he talks about uh, motivation. And it turns out giving people autonomy is the number one motivator. Um, it's much more important than money or status or great colleagues. And this can be little things like letting people choose their own setup at work. Uh, this is one of our developers. He chose to have five screens because he thinks he's more productive that way. Why not give him that freedom and let him choose? But autonomy is much more than that. It's more letting people um, choose how they approach their, their tasks, empowering the teams, giving them a lot of freedom to decide how they do it. Number six is about mastery. The best teams understand that in order to be world-class, you need to be world-class in your field. If you're the product guy or the developer or the designer, you need to be world-class and you need to learn. It's a lifelong learning process. Think about teams like the, the Navy SEALs. They practice relentlessly. That's why they're so good. They, they spend 90% of their time practicing and 10% in the battlefield. That's why they're so good. So, the best teams have something about mastery and excellence in their culture. This is from our company Grammarly. They say, each of us aspires to be the leader in what we do by striving for individual mastery. And in my company, GameDuel, we also have um, a lot of things to help people grow and learn. So we, we invite a lot of industry experts um, so everybody in their field can become better. So this is Werner Vogels, the CTO of Amazon. He gave a talk. Uh, about cloud computing. We get a lot of people from the open source community to talk with our developers. We do a lot of uh, learning events. There's a company in Malaysia, one of my favorite companies, Mind Valley. They take this to the next level. They have this awesome lecture hall, which they call the Hall of Awesomeness. And they do almost every evening, there are some talks there where the team can learn and grow. They even invite other companies to uh, rent that space which is great for recruiting also because you get a lot of visitors to your office and then they see the culture and then they hire some of them. So it's about learning and mastery. Number seven, you need to communicate the culture. It's like communication. You cannot not communicate. You cannot not have a culture. The question is just, is it clear to everybody or is it very fuzzy? Do people really know what the culture is? The best teams, they communicate what their core values are. This is from the Facebook office. They have these core values on big posters everywhere. I'm sure you've seen those. Done is better than perfect. Move fast and break, break things. Proceed and be bold. The best teams, they communicate very clearly what their values are. And most of them also have like a handbook, a culture book. This is from Valve, the company that makes Steam. Uh, it's a really cool book. They give it to every new employee and it's describing their values and their, how their organization works. This is from Zappos. They also have a culture book. They create a new one every year where the whole team can contribute and share their stories about how they view the values and what they think about the culture. This is very cool. Um, but it also has to come from the, from the top. The leaders of the team have to live the culture by example. They have to be role models. And some people say that that's the most important job of the CEO is actually it's chief energy officer. The job is to be the icon for the culture and talk to the team about the values. Number eight, measure your culture. The best teams, they, they see if they walk the talk. They, they, they track if people are living the values. This is Tony Shea, the CEO from Zappos. And I love this. This is his office, actually. He's sitting right in the middle of the, of the room. It's like a 2,000 people company. And he's a very humble guy. And he says, make culture part of everyone's performance review. So when they do their feedback talks, they talk about their values. If, if one of their values is be humble, they, they check how humble are you as a person. Um, and also measure how you as an organization stand up against the values. If you say, we, our value is autonomy and empowering people, do you really do that? Or is it just talk? So Spotify, one of their values is empowering people and having autonomous teams, and they ask their teams on a regular basis, 
how empowered do you feel? Do you get autonomy? And then they measure that. Number nine is about high performers. The best teams understand that you can only be world class in what you do when you have world class people on, on the team. In every position, you need really good people. So they focus on high performers in their culture. This is from The Motley Fool. Uh, interesting tip, take the next week and only spend time on your highest performers. That will add value faster than hand-holding your low performers. They also say in every job interview that they do with applicants, you should put one of your best people in there to make sure that you hire only other good performers. Unfortunately, many of these high performer people, or not many, but, but some of these high performer people have a little bit of an ego attitude. I call them superstars. So they're very strong characters, like divas. And these people, they're very good in what they do, but they can destroy a culture like that. If you have one of these on your team, it can be very bad for, for the whole organization. So at my company, Game Though, we have a no star culture. We don't want these people. What we rather look for is, we call it a superhero attitude instead of a superstar attitude. So think of, of the superstar. Superstar wants to be in the limelight and get all the attention. The superhero, this is more like this. They, they go, there's a robbery or something happening, a crime. They, they fly there, they help, and then they, they fly away. They, they don't wait until the press comes and take pictures and all that. They're more humble people, and they're more about the team and the team spirit and the we. And in fact, um, this, this kind of attitude turns out to be more productive and more successful. There's research on this by, by Dave Logan. Uh, he wrote this book, Tribal Leadership, and they analyzed different cultures and attitudes on, and the impact on performance. And he found that companies that have a strong ego culture with, with these superstars, where it's all about me and it's very competitive internally, like I'm better than you, uh, and comparing it to cultures where it's more about we, where, more about the team, the, the team cultures outperform those ego cultures in the long run. So nice little uh, anecdote about this, um, about this superhero attitude. We, we once had a project, a game to be launched. It was quite a tough deadline. Had to be launched before Christmas. And we thought, okay, let's make sure that the, the people make the deadline. So we, we said, you get a, a bonus if you make the deadline. And the superstar would have said, yeah, great, OK, I'm going to make it. But the team, having more of a superhero attitude, they actually came back to us and said, we think this is not the best to give us this bonus. We would prefer if you do something for the whole company, for everybody. So they came up with the idea to get a pool bear table if they make the deadline. So they were not doing it for them. They were doing it for the whole team, for the whole company. And that was a bigger motivator for them. And it turned out also for the whole company. They were all helping the team out. And they created an amazing dynamic in the whole team. And for sure, they made the deadline. And uh, this is a photo from our lounge, one of our all-hands meetings. And the, the pool bear table is a daily reminder for us of that superhero attitude, how that can create magic in a team. These are the 10 differentiators. There's a, a lot more, of course. So we've created a website, insidegamedo.com, where you can learn more about our values and see some videos about the team. This is my favorite topic, so please send me an email if you want to talk about this, share your stories. I can also send you a copy of the slide deck, because I believe by heart that culture indeed eats strategy for breakfast. Thanks. Really, is this on? Yeah. Really excellent talk. I am such a Peter Drucker nerd. I saw <laughs> so much Peter Drucker in there. The tree rots from the top down, and anything you do can be measured. And there's so many questions I want to ask, but I'm going to try to limit them. Okay. So uh, I see of your few points, uh, two of them come from self-determination theory, which says that people are happiest when they have autonomy, mastery, and a reward that uh, they feel is proportional to the effort that they expend. So they, they want to feel like they're rewarded based on their output. Now, I can't imagine that all compensation is pool table based. So uh, do you make efforts to tie compensation to reward and uh, 
like how does that manifest in policy? Yeah, our monetary compensation, I think, needs to be taken care of. That's, that has to be off the table. Um, and you have to pay your people well, especially if, to, if you have high performers. They, they want a good salary mark, above market, maybe even, um, because they're really good people. And I've seen high performers, they add like 10x the value to normal people. So definitely make sure you pay your team well. But that usually is not the number one thing to motivate them. If you get that off the table, it's more the other factors that are important. If you have somebody who you pay him an amazing amount of money, but all the rest is not there, they will not be happy, and at least not in the long run. Except for some superstars, I call them mercenaries. They come in, they get a lot of money, they do their job, then they leave, they go to the next company. You have these kind of people. It can make sense to, to hire some of them if you have like an emergency situation. You need that ex super specialist to fix your server or something, you get them in. But in the long run, I believe you have to have a team where money is not the main driving force, but they come more for the motivation of, of what they do, the purpose, the, the great vision of the company, and the team, and the team spirit, and the atmosphere. That's a much bigger motivator. That's why I get out of bed in the morning, because I want to work with, with great people and uh, be inspired and walk into the office, smile, people come. It's, it's a great vibe, and that drives me. But of course, monetary has to be taken care of too. All right. There are a thousand questions I would like to ask, but the audience would uh, murder me. So, audience. And um, in a culture like this, how do you deal with career development? Because, uh, I mean, one thing that I had in previous comments, for instance, mm -hmm. is yeah, one thing, this is very good to have a, a good vibe now. But sometimes I was challenged by the idea okay, oh, how about five years from now? Mm -hmm. What is this company doing? in a way for me also, by saying that, of course, I'm doing for the government, but how, what kind of future are they giving to me if I stay here in five years? How do you deal with the future and the needs of everybody to develop? I think that's uh, actually one of the biggest motivators also is uh, personal growth. And uh, I had this point here, mastery. That's also from Daniel Pink. He says autonomy, mastery. Uh, these are two big points. So give the team the possibility to develop and learn. That's why all these learning events, so they can grow and they can learn maybe different skills. We even had uh, give people the opportunity to change their career track. So we had one guy, he was a developer for several years, and then he said he would like to become um, a game designer. And he had no experience in game design, but he said, okay, let's try it out. Now he's uh, one of our best game designers and, and with the company for, uh, for seven years now. So give people that chance to grow within your company. That's Hi, uh, thank you for such, uh, such great presentation. And uh, I have a question, who is responsible for building this uh, corporate, co corporate culture? This is a CEO or HR department or whatever, who is, who is doing this? I think everybody should contribute to that. But of course, if you start the team, then it's the founders who start it. And they have to come together with the vision about their culture. They have to be aligned on how they think about culture. So when we started the company, it was three people, um, my two business partners and I, and we sat together, that was one of the first things we did. We sat together at a bar for several hours, a couple of beers, and, and wrote down what our personal values are and vision for the, for the culture. Because we all had companies before, and in some of those companies, the culture was not so good. And we said, we don't want to work in a company like that anymore, because that's where we're going to spend so much time. You want to create a company that is like your family, that, that you feel at home. And you want to make sure that everybody you get in, the first employee you hire, and then the next, they all fit exactly to that, to that mindset, how you see the, the company and the culture. So initially, you, you set uh, the ground for that, and you create the values, and then you communicate it. And you make sure you only get people in the chair. And then you have to, the bigger the company gets, the more you have to communicate about the culture. Because at some point, you will not be able to control everything. And there will be, if you have like 5,000 people in the company, then people get hired, you cannot interview everybody personally. So that's why you need the culture book like Valve. And that's why you need to have the stories because cu culture is communicated through stories. It's not if you have a list and say, these are our values, people will not know what it means. So you need to transport that by giving examples. What does it mean humble? What does it mean autonomy? And then that's how Zappos, they do it uh, in a very nice way where the, the people they have 
everybody from the team, they interview them uh, on video and they talk about how do I see our core, core value number three? What is my idea of that? And then people share that and they share these stories. That's, that's a really powerful way to, to communicate the culture. Thank you so much, Michael. Okay, thanks.